Hello, good evening, good day. Uh, welcome to the 16th episode of the Indian Interest Podcast. I hope you're all doing very well. Um, we're going to discuss a number of things today. Uh, very important and interesting things are going on geo- in, in the world of geopolitics in, in international relations. We're going to discuss that. But before we do that, let me greet you all. Let's see who all is there on the live chat. I can see Vidhan, Piyush, Prasad, Manmat, Ashish, Srinivash, Srinivas, De- Deba Mandal, Kelvin, Nisarg, Sharang, Rahul, Bhanu Prakash, Ak- Akarshan, Durga, Ashwin, Yuvraj, Arsh, Vladimir Putin, Davaldeep Gaur, Malhar, Samudra Gupta, Rishi, Nirbhai, Jamtani, Jay Prakash, Abhay, Asmanor, Karan Nalabat, Akash Kumar Singh, Atharva Pranav, Shiva Prasad, Manmat, Matteo Perez, Matteo Perez, Akash Dikshit, uh, Abhinav, GK, Somye, Saurabh, Trupti, Dude, Ak- Akarsh, Siddhant, Aditi, Librando Detector, <laughs> Melvin, Sam Bid, Uday Pratap Singh, Vinit Krishna, Sai Aditya, Raja Kumar, Tiyasha Haldar, Vinod Kanna, Chewingam, Shriyansh, Arsh, Niku, Om, Tejashri, Jai, Atharva, and lots and lots of other people. Good evening, good day, all of you, wherever you are. I hope you're doing great. So what shall we discuss? I think we should start uh, where we should start, which is the most uh, important thing that's happened in in the past week, which is the incident along the India-Tibet border, Chinese-occupied Tibet, around uh, in, in uh, Arunachal Pradesh, right? So let's see the news report. What does the news report say? Yes, let's let's discuss this. What's going on here? So Arunachal Pradesh, over 200 people's enslavement army groups came with spiked clubs and taser guns and all that, and Indian soldiers hit back. So the Chinese were attempting to cross over into the Indian side of the LAC, and uh, they were initially challenged by eight uh, by 50 Indian soldiers before Indian backup arrived, and that outnumbered the PLA troops and overwhelmed them. And uh, they were there was. There, there were scuffles and there was a scuffle, you know, uh, spy, they were armed with spiked clubs with nails on them, monkey fists and taser guns and all that. That's what the Chinese had. And the Indians were suitably well prepared. Yeah, crude weapons, uh, so supposedly crude weapons. So that's what the print says. And the Hindu says Indian Chinese soldiers in, in, injured in clash near Arunachal border. Uh, where did this happen? It's showing the location. It says the Ten, the tense Yangtze area. Yangtze area. And over here also, I'm sure it says Yangtze. The first thing I would like to say is that why do Indian publications, why does the Indian media use Chinese names? Why does it call this area the Yangtze area? Yangtze is a Chinese name. The region that we are talking about is Arunachal Pradesh, which is India, and Tibet. Tibet doesn't have Chinese names. Lhasa isn't a Chinese name, right? So, And the Chinese have uh, recently given Chinese names to various places. Why do, does the Indian media have to parrot those Chinese names? Why can't we use the actual proper names? Or maybe the Indian media is ignorant and they know nothing. They're simply copy-pasting what the Chinese have reported. So this is very uh, unfortunate. It is very disappointing on the part of the print and the Hindu but yeah, it's not surprising. It's disappointing. It's unfortunate, but it is not surprising. Very poor reporting. Yangtze. Why do we have to call it Yangtze? Yangtze is a Chinese name. Anyhow, so that's what happened. And uh, there were some fractures, apparently. It says a few soldiers sustained fractured limbs, limbs, which means that the injuries are not insignificant. Fractures are not, no, no, a fracture is not a small injury. Yeah, so that's what happened. It says around 600 Chinese soldiers were present where the clashes took place and so on. So there are various kinds of report, reports that have come out. Um, th- that's the thing. And then uh, there's this viral clip that suddenly made its appearance in, in social media. Uh, a clip that uh, clearly took place about a year ago because the, the, that's, a, again, a clip of Indian and Chinese soldiers clashing on the LAC. And it's very clear that the Indians gave the Chinese quite a pummeling, quite a beating. And there's this wonderful Punjabi commentary in the background 
uh, and so on. Yeah, so this uh, this clip, this this video clip went viral worldwide. Yeah, the the in the West they were the they found it uh, amusing that these two nuclear powers they have agreed by mutual consensus to fight only with melee weapons, not even range weapons, no sharp weapons. At at most, you will fight with stones and sticks and clubs with pointed end pointed sticks and uh, pointed nails or whatever and things like that right so the indians use a variety of weapons the chinese use, use a variety of weapons and uh, the and uh, and i think firing is not allowed and yet the chinese on a couple of times have actually used firearms maybe in the air or whatever no indian has received gunshot wounds but that's what's happening so the world has been quite amused to see this new clip that suddenly appeared on social media and uh, there are interesting Chinese reactions that have come out. How the Chinese reacting? So the Chinese speak about, um, well, uh, why do we need to fight a war against India? We have a political party ruling over us for 70 years. How immature is it for them to rely on border conflicts to divert attention from other problems? This, these are, uh, this is what the Chinese people are saying on, on Chinese social media. Yes, there are too many internal conflicts and this looks like a distraction. Uh, the Russian media is referring to the point of conflict as Arunachal Pradesh and not South Tibet. The Russian media is trying to sabotage the friendship between China and Russia. Uh, so various kinds of reactions. Why do we wait for foreign media to report this? India's economic growth rate is the highest among all major countries and it will not want a war now which may affect its growth prospects. Um, Last time he said there were no deaths for PLA and only India had casualties. This time you said no casualties on both sides. What is the truth? Uh, we must first fix internal issues before fighting enemies outside. India always releases news reports quickly, but the Chinese try to hide the news. Our media to Xi Jinping, it says, oh leader, how can we report? Can we report this? And how do we report this? Uh, Oh, here it says it looks like a well-planned combination of punches for China. The U.S. recently sanctioned former officials of the Tibet Autonomous Region. Then a Chinese hotel was targeted in Afghanistan. Beijing is, is seeing a peak or peaking of the epidemic again. Diplomatic uh, attacks on China by foreign agencies. And now this border skirmish. No word on PLA casualties and so on and so forth. Lots and lots of uh, Chinese reactions, which kind of tell you the state of mind among the Chinese people, right? So that's what's happening. Uh, so the Chinese seem to be disappointed. The Chinese citizens seem to be disappointed by what's happened. Yes, it is clear that the Chinese army has suffered a lot of injuries here. It cannot defeat the Indian army. Chinese soldiers are basically in the army to support their families and earn money. How can child soldiers who have the military spirit to fight and win wars? Let us check and report the number of casualties for the PLA and so on and so forth. So if the Chinese people are able to understand that there is the situation going on within China. This incredible peaking of the COVID-19 or COVID, whatever it is, epidemic, yeah, pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of internal problems in, in China right now, lots of dissent, lots of frustration among the population. It's a very rebellious attitude. Yes, there is this, the economy is not doing well. The, the, the uh, real estate sector, it's a big bubble that's kind of crumbling right now. Lots of economic and other social problems. Uh, law and order problems, the pandemic problems, so many problems within China. So the Chinese citizens are saying that the Chinese government, the, the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, Mr. Xi Jinping, they are trying to divert our attention from, from the real issues at home by, by creating this problem with India. That's what the Chinese citizens kind of are, are feeling. And they are not really trusting what the Chinese are saying, that how... The Chinese are saying that there were casualties on both sides, injuries. But what, what is the truth? Because the last time it was clear the Chinese suffered more casualties in the Galwan clash than the Indian side. And the Chinese media, they, they hid this for a very long time. Eventually, the, the truth came out and the Chinese kind of lost a bit of trust in the government. So this is the, these are the Chinese reactions. The Chinese reactions are very different from the Western reactions. The Western reactions are more like, you know, they, they are amused about the fact that two nuclear powers are fighting with sticks and stones. So the Chinese, they have very different reactions, and they are quite concerned, and they are kind of expressing uh, their reluctance to believe the official uh, reports in the Chinese media and, and what's given out by the Chinese Communist Party. So that is the situation vis-a-vis -vis the, the, how the world is reacting to this. Now, what has actually happened? So we know that uh, 
our defense minister mr rajnath singh gave a statement in parliament in which he has give, laid out the the official version of what happened that um, there was this this clash and the indian side was very firm and resolute and there were some injuries on both sides but nothing serious yeah uh the rumors though say that something else has happened so this let's put this on the screen so uh this is a twitter account that is followed by lots of very uh serious journalists yeah um so this is not some uh, random anonymous twitter account this is a twitter account that has a that has a good standing among the military and osint and journalistic circles so let's see what it says here one mago marks the southern entrance of the valley and chuna the northern end of it bordering the lac the line of actual control steep mountainous terrain which needs hours of trekking to reach the posts and okay uh peak xxx sits to the west of this area and has a commanding view of the ridges and tracks along the across the lac deep into kona county which is the chinese occupied territory the pla sent in roughly 300 troops with melee weapons with a clear intention to kill or maim the indian army troops holding the area so this was a deliberate action by the chinese it was initiated by the chinese it was not some accidental meeting of the two armies It, this was deliberately initiated by the chinese right closely packed uh, closely placed echelons on the lower ridges of the, and the river valley were quickly able to reinforce the 50 troops firm 50 indian troops firmly facing the pla onslaught and reinforcements poured in from multiple directions immediately after being radioed right what started with abuses and stone pelting gradually progressed to fisticuffs you know and then fierce hand to hand combat where the pla troops were overpowered and in some cases their weapons were used against them this free for all went on until the pla found itself losing ground with many of their troops overpowered and battered while indian army troops kept pouring in with their own melee weapons things went south from there and the pla troops started falling back the indian army troops were in no mood to relent and went after the retreating pla troops who were running for their lives after having borne the brunt of the counter attack gunshots were heard from the pla's rear as they attempted to deter further assault so that the things got desperate for the pla and this entire thing happened on their perceived side of the of the of the lac uh, once the the once they started who you know falling back The area of the face-off has been reinforced, and the units in the vicinity are on a high state of alert, which means the Indian side. Mm-hmm. All in all, a very comprehensive drubbing for the PLA, with a dozen plus of their troops dead or extremely critical, which means skulls opened or crushed. Now there is no government confirmation of of this account. There is no Chinese confirmation of this account, and you will not find any confirmation of this. but um this is an, an interesting um you could say revelation over here right because i i um, because this account this gentleman uh, is highly regarded in in defense and osint open source intelligence matters and lots of very prominent defense journalists follow this account so this is what this is what possibly could have happened there is no confirmation of this but here here is the an interesting perspective of what happened now the question is the question is what's going on we know that just a few weeks ago prime minister modi met briefly spoke briefly with president xi jinping in bali there was a bali g20 summit where this happened it was in in the middle of november 15 16 november if i'm not mistaken yeah and it was Pr- prime minister modi who took the initiative to go and speak with president xi jinping so mr modi decided to take the initiative and try and defuse tensions that had been simmering since the 2020 galwan clash which again the chinese had initiated yes so mr modi took the initiative to try and kind of lower the tensions by you know because the past two years there was no interaction between the two leaders even in in the central i think it was in tashkent or samarkand or wherever the, the, the sco summit happened the two leaders did not even acknowledge each other, each other they did not even nod at each other or say hello or whatever no shake hands nothing like they don't see each other that sort of relationship was going on so in bali mr modi took the initiative and then the reaction to that very quickly has been this chinese essentially uh, 
attempt to intrude upon Indian territory and try to kill Indian soldiers, yeah, with melee weapons. So that's been the response. So what is the deal? Why is this happening? What are the Chinese intentions? This is clearly a provocation that was initiated by the Chinese. The Indians did not initiate this. So, once again, let me draw you draw your attention to something I had said a long time ago, not very long ago, in March, March 4, 2022. I said that India needs to prepare for a short, sharp 1962-like conflict with China. Could happen before 2024 or in 2024. The Chinese objective will be to inflict a quick military defeat on India, to bisect India, maybe in the Siliguri corridor somewhere there. That would be the Chinese objective. And that could possibly, in the Chinese in, in the Chinese would hope that that could cause the current government, the Modi government, to lose the 2024 election. Before, because if a government, which is a nationalistic government, suffers a defeat, then then that defeat is blamed on the leadership, and then people lose trust in that government. That's what typically happens. You can give any kind of argument, but that is the that is how it happens. That is how it goes. The Indian people are an emotional people and they will say that the, the leadership has made a huge mess of things and now we need to change, you know, vote somebody for somebody else. Uh, and like I said, all indications are that, the, are that the US anticipates the possibility of such a short, sharp war between India and China. So India must be ready. This is what I had said at that time. Uh, this is in March. This is right after the Russian uh, special military operation in Ukraine, right? So, and why did I say that the US anticipates this? It's because the US had already unleashed this wave of, of social media attacks on India via its various uh, think tank experts and journalists, the people I call disposable minions, you know, various people for hire. Typically, people who uh, work in think tanks, people who are journalists. So let me show you some examples of what was being said at the time. There was a relentless assault, uh, social media assault on India. Here's one example. This person, Robert Shrimsley, whoever it is. Uh, this is a person from the UK, chief UK political commentator of Financial Times. He says that India's abstention is a useful wake-up call to those in the West, taking it up as a part of the alliance of democratic countries they want to build. Yeah. Here's another. Edward Luce. Who is Edward Luce? Associate editor, Financial Times, US-based person. Whatever the calculations, misplaced loyalties or misjudgments, India is at risk of abdicating its respect as one of the world's leading democracies. Yeah. Here's more. Derek Grossman, who belongs to Rand Corporation or who works for Rand Corporation. India abstains at the UN again. This time on something as anodyne as discussing human rights in Ukraine. Icky stuff. Icky. India is so icky. Yeah, that's what he says. Derek Grossman. Then here is Jeff Smith, who a lot of Indians seem to admire a lot and love a lot for some reason, because sometimes he says good things about India. Here's what he says. I understand and I have tried to explain the Indian government's bind regarding Russia and the Ukraine crisis. Most folks seem to get it. What I can't sympathize with is Indian commentators gleefully spouting Russian propaganda and cheering on Putin. You took the wrong pill, com comrades. That's what this gentleman has to say. Uh, here's more. And Andrew Gwyn, Gwyn, whatever, UK, I guess. Uh, we've got, we have an urgent question following the Prime Minister's trade visit to India. This was in April. The PM couldn't be bothered to turn up. I asked about human rights abuses, uh, alleged, you know, this is what they claim. These people have always claimed this to pressurize India about Kashmir and all that nonsense. Uh, clauses on human rights will be included in the deal and so on. Here is Anne Applebaum. Um, I guess she's from the Atlantic. India, South Africa, two large democracies abstain. Shameful, shameful, right? So the, this is just these are just a few examples of what happened. So the U.S., the West, unleashed this enormous wave, this enormous wave of propaganda that sought to to portray India, to paint India as a a nation that sides with the aggressor, with Russia, a nation that doesn't deserve to have any respect, a nation that is undemocratic, a nation that has human rights abuses, all that nonsense. The same old stereotypes that they've been spouting for decades. So they unleash this all over again in February, March, April, and so on this year. Yes, slowly over time, it's kind of toned down. But the intention of this most likely is to 
condition the western mind the mind of the gullible average average intelligence uh, western person it's to condition their mind and prepare them mentally for the for the possibility that if india and china go to war then the west will stay out of it and we, they will say that you don't deserve to be helped they will tell india that you should have stood on our side when it came to ukraine so now that you are at war with china for whatever reason we will not stand on your side and we we we, we will throw you under the bus yeah so they are they were at that time mentally preparing the west for the possibility that they would abandon india and refuse to support india despite india being a democracy against the authoritarian communist chinese dictatorship if india and china were to clash or go to war right so uh so i had said that there could be a short sharp war with china before 2024 it's it still could happen yes and why so the strange thing <laughs> is that there is a great deal of convergence between the us and china vis-a-vis the modi government neither the US, neither the us nor china is very happy about the fact that uh, there is a very strong nationalistic government with a strong and independent r- robust foreign policy in india the us would like to see a manmohan singh ka- type ka- type of government in india which was very pliable and which was very malleable they they essentially did whatever the americans told them an extremely weak need foreign policy and even internal policy even the chinese like the manmohan singh kind of government in india because that that gives them a great deal of advantage it is not in their interest whether it's the us or china to have someone like narendra modi in power in india so they would so there's a great deal of convergence when it comes to india to the us and china in how they regard and what their opinion of this government is neither wants this government to last and that's why it is in the interest of the us and in the interest of china to see the modi government maybe lose the election in 2024 right so the us we know that it and the us also wants to punish india for having an independent foreign policy for for in the in the ukraine war especially and for buying russian oil lots of russian oil and for refusing to condemn and sanction china and for essentially having a very strong and independent foreign policy yeah so that's why we had all these twitter attacks by the disposable minions of the us both the us and china want to see modi fail in 2024 yeah so i then i said this that there could be see this is uh, and then we know what the us started doing right the americans uh, the american ambassador in in pakistan started referring to uh, the illegally pakistani occupied portion of jammu and kashmir as azad uh, so called azad kashmir yeah so they started taking the pakistani side and just uh, two three weeks after uh, after uh, dr jay shankar visited uh, the pentagon uh, we had the visit of this person bajwa khamar javed bajwa the, the chief of the pakistani army uh, he went to the same place pentagon and he was gra- given a very warm welcome by the americans and they decided they discussed long their long standing defense partnership and areas of mutual interest right so i said what are the areas of mutual interest essentially countering india's peaceful rise what else So I said, expect a U.S. rapprochement with Xi Jinping next, sooner or later after this month's CCP 20th National Congress. I said, I said, I'm not kidding. This was on October 5. Yeah. So in October, you had the Chinese Communist Party's 20th National Congress. Then you had the Bali summit, and then I said just a couple of days ago that this. US China rapprochement is most likely happening right now as we speak. Why did I say this? Because these pieces of news then emerged. US delegates in China talk on improving ties and they talk on Taiwan. This was on December 12. Uh US China talks, talks took place on Sunday and Monday last week. Now uh, this weekend last weekend in the northern province of Hebei. Beijing said and they discussed ways to improve ties the issue of tai- taiwan and they laid the groundwork for a planned visit by secretary of state anthony blinken and so on and more senior us officials visit china hold talks with vice foreign minister and the the talks were apparently frank in depth and constructive yes so it looks like it looks like there is a rapprochement between the us and china that could possibly happening 
be happening right now why would the americans want to shake hands with the chinese and come to some sort of sort of agreement some sort of rapprochement the reason for that is that the us no longer fears china's imminent rise take a look at this china's economy will not overtake the us until 2060 if ever Yes, the consensus that Beijing can achieve whatever target it, it sets ignores the pace of slowdown in recent years. Yeah, uh, Xi Jinping's goal is to make China a mid-level developed country in the next decade, which implies that the economy will need to expand at a rate of around five percent per year. But underlying trends, bad demographics, heavy heavy debt, and declining productivity growth suggest that the overall the country's overall growth rate is about half of that. china is most likely growing at 2.5% the last couple of years it may have actually the gdp growth may possibly have been in the negative numbers you know it may have shrunk and the best case scenario is that china's economy will be growing at 2.5% and there are lots of demographic issues social issues the population is very rapidly becoming really old it is aging yeah so if you assume that the us grows at 1.5% with similar rates of inflation and stable exchange rate china could would not overtake america as the world's largest economy until 2060 if ever so this is the situation and i have spoken about this multiple times but then i found this news report so what's happened is that china's great growth story has has stopped the pandemic destroyed it the pandemic essentially destroyed china's growth the economy is now very stagnant there are lots of problem problems huge uh, debt the the there's this banking bubble the the real estate bubble in china aging population declining growth everywhere declining exports declining production lots and lots of problem these constant never ending lockdowns yep and the pandemic ensured that the the bri the chinese belt and road initiative it it essentially became stagnant it's no longer there's no progress on that yeah so uh so that that's the that's what's happened and it, india contributed greatly to this the chinese were hoping that the russians will become a chinese vassal state after february 24 the russian invasion of ukraine that did not happen because india started purchasing enormous quantities of russian oil so russia did not have to go begging to china for for help the russians were able to manage without becoming a chinese vassal so the chinese gained nothing out of the pandemic or from the ukraine invasion right so china is no longer on 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 the path to becoming a superpower anytime soon china is merely the great power in asia that one of one of two or three great powers india russia china yeah so the americans no longer fear china's imminent rise and the americans would prefer to keep dealing with one major rival china and the americans do not want to see the emergence of a new rival india so they want to keep india down and they would like to keep cooperating with china and and come to an agreement that we will both work together to keep india down and russia down and that sort of thing could be happening that's what i mean by a us china rapprochement now the chinese economy is now struggling very badly the bri is stagnant dead in the water like i've said but the chinese obviously will not give up the chinese will not give up why should they just lie down and die they will fight the chinese will fight they will not give up they xi jinping wants to resurrect the bri the belt and road initiative in some way in or some shape or some form right and recently we have the china arab summit just a week ago just this week right the, the xi jinping went to saudi arabia he met with the various leaders of the arab world he met with uh, mohammed bin salman he met with uh, king salman as well there were more than 30 agreements between china and saudi arabia and we also have the china iran deal which was uh, signed a year or so ago yes uh, a 400 billion dollar investment of chinese investment into iran yeah in exchange for a steady supply of oil from iran yes so the chinese are going to keep pushing they're going to keep fighting and they, they may get us help in this because the americans are not happy with the, the possibility of india's rise because india is now showing a very independent foreign policy india is showing that we will not be cowed down and beaten back we will not tow your line we will do what is best for us yeah so that's what's happening now the question is what about brics yeah so what about brics for for from the perspective of china BRICS is about China first. The Chinese will put their interests first. The 
when you create a coalition or confederation of nations, you create it for your own interest, not for the interest of the overall community. So for China, BRICS is about China first. They care about China. And if BRICS no longer serves the purpose, then they will keep it alive, but they will then negotiate with various countries one to one. So that's what was the that's what the China Saudi Arabia thing was. That this was not a BRICS and Saudi Arabia uh, meeting. This was a China Saudi Arabia meeting. So the Chinese will put their interests first, not the BRICS interests first. So they will be very happy, the Chinese, to bypass BRICS altogether and use BRICS in whatever way suits them best, in whatever way favors them. But they will always put their interests first. And when it comes to China, they are in a position to uh, to purchase l a lot more oil from the Saudis than India can. Yeah, so that would obviously offer the Saudis an incentive to to make well with China. To you know that, so that's the deal. So BRICS is not that important for China. They 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 will use BRICS for you know in a variety of ways that favor them, but it's all about China first. Now, what about Russia? Well. Russia, the fact, the truth is that Russia needs China more than Russia needs India. China is much more powerful. It has got much more money, much deeper pockets. And Russia also has the problem that they, the Russia shares a long, long border with China. That's always an, an issue, right? So Russia needs China more than Russia needs India. On the other hand, Russia needs India to counterbalance China. So there is this tug of war going on. And that's the deal. But we have to remember this, my friends. Let me put that on the screen, what I had said. Remember this, India has no allies. I have been saying this for the past two, three weeks. I've been showing you documentary evidence that India has no allies. There are no friends in geopolitics. How many times have I said this? Please understand that. Stop having some, some kind of love, one-sided love or one-sided soft corner for some nation. There are no friends, friends in geopolitics. And right now, India doesn't even have allies. An alliance is something that you that you take for, forward on, on, on a long-term basis, India doesn't even have allies right now. And that's fine. The truth is that Russia cannot help India if there's a war with China. And neither can or will Japan or Israel. And USA, UK, NATO, Australia, the liberal democracies, they will watch from the sidelines and they, will, they all want India to fail. So India is on its own, which is fine. India is no longer a tiny, miserable little country. You know, India is now a great power on its, in its own right, a small great power. It's not a regional power or, or medium power. India is now a great power because of a variety of reasons. So India needs to ensure, what is this? Sorry. So India needs to keep on working towards. So, so the question now is, if India has no friends, if India has no allies, if BRICS, uh, all these things are happening, then what should India do? What should India do? Uh, so I had put out a number of things over here. Let me just uh, add something. So first of all, India may need to increase its military budget. So right now, you know, India's military budget is less than 3% of India's GDP. If you look at a nation like Israel, it's almost 6% of the GDP. So I would say that India needs to maybe double, possibly, its military budget. Obviously, it, it will need, that will mean that we will have to cut corners somewhere else. Maybe, you know, uh, cut down on expenditure in other areas. But yeah, you know, it may be necessary. So I think one of the things India can do is increase the military budget, maybe bring it to around 5% of GDP. That would be great. Right now it's less than 3%. So maybe around 5% of GDP so that we can invest more money in acquiring uh, you know, more military muscle. Uh, the other thing India could do is acquire some strategic bombers from Russia. The Tupolev 160, that was blackjack that we spoke about, uh, I think, last week. Sometime last week, I think. So acquire strategic bombers. It will give India more options. Uh, in in uh, it's it's to be used as a deterrent against China. So right now the one option that we have is ballistic missiles to keep China in check. You know we have this thing and you need to behave. But if we have strategic bombers, it gives you more options, more me different ways of delivering a nuclear payload. We never want to do that, but the option has to be available. So. Uh, Maybe India should acquire those sick that package of six Tupolev 160 strategic bombers from Russia, like they've been talking about. It should not take the next. They should not talk for the next five or ten years. If you're going to do it, do it now. Get it done quickly. Maybe in the next year or so, because you'll need to train pilots and all that. So it may take a year or so. 
get it done get those topolev 160 strategic bombers that package of six bombers that would be fantastic it will give india lots of options in a variety of ways um what else should india do india should learn the lessons of the ukraine war first of all uh, the ukraine war the artasak conflict the azerbaijan armenia conflict loitering munitions suicide drones these are going to play a big role in warfare that is for mainly for tactic, tactical uses but also the other thing we have seen in the ukraine war is that russia has needed lots and lots and lots of cruise missiles yeah you don't want to the russians have decided consciously not to use their air force to do bombing strikes in ukraine they have relied only on cruise missiles that way they are able to safeguard their air force that the huge air force that they have for a future larger conflict the ukraine conflict is a proxy war with nato but in the future the russians may have to get into a real war with nato for that they will need their air force to be intact so they don't want to risk much of the air force in open combat or or open or, or operations over ukraine so they are relying only on cruise missiles on on a variety of cruise missiles yeah and they have they must have used up thousands of cruise missiles by now since uh, the end of february right so the the lesson one of the major lessons from the ukraine conflict is that if you want to fight a, a war that may take a long time several months you need lots and lots of cruise missiles you know 50 brahmos missiles will not do it or or 200 brahmos missiles will not do it you and and once again it's wrong to rely only on one kind of cruise missile the brahmos is a, is a supersonic cruise missile mark 2 cruise missile you may you also want to have different kinds of cruise missiles maybe the what's it called the nearby cruise missile which has a range of i don't know what is it 1500 kilometers something like that it's a subsonic cruise missile but you need multiple kinds of cruise missiles and you need them in large quantities i would say that india needs to have a stockpile of about 10000 cruise missiles of of various kinds so that is another thing india needs to work on for that you will need ex- an expanded military budget and then obviously you also want to uh, diversify your ballistic missile inventory we have the agni 5 uh, we have a whole uh, spectrum of agni missiles and prithvi missiles we also have the agni prime the agni 5 has an almost intermediate or ballist or, or intercontinental range we need to fit those missiles onto submarines we need the submarine launched equivalents of all these missiles so especially the k5 missile which has the same range as the agni 5 missile we need to quickly very rapidly uh, develop it if it is not yet developed and we need to fit those that missile and and make it operational yeah on submarines so, so if you have that then you can launch a missile if ever required from any place in the bay of bengal or any other part of the world if you are in a submarine you can launch it from anywhere and th- you know that gives you a whole lot of options if you have that and of course we need more submarines and now right now india has what 15 submarines 17 submarines i'm not sure that is that is woefully inadequate if you want to have 20 submarines deployed at any given point in time you need 60 submarines in total and this may sound very strange and counterintuitive to you here is a secret it's not a secret if any naval person will know this if you have 60 naval assets only if you if you have x number of naval assets only one third of them can be deployed actively at any given point in time let's say you have three ships out of those three ships one will be actively deployed somewhere one will be at the port undergoing refits or refueling or whatever it is and one will be either going towards deployment or coming back from its old deployment so only out of three only one at any given point in time is actively deployed so if india wants to have 20 submarines actively deployed at, a, at all times india needs to invest in at least 60 submarines for that to happen that is how it goes in the in the naval world right so india needs more submarines and I, I would say that India should uh, invest in cheaper submarines. Why? Why invest in, in submarines that cost a billion dollars? Try and acquire submarines that cost a hundred million dollars. Cheap, you know. Uh, I'm sure that it's not. It's easier said than done. Of, of course, yeah. But we need to find ways of doing this. Mm-hmm. For instance, the Gotland class uh, class Swedish submarine costs just a hundred million dollars. Yeah, it is. It is. 
it is quite cheap you know relatively speaking so um of course the swedes are uh, well they will not be so inclined to to sell submarines to india and so on so but india needs to find ways and means of doing this so we need ssns we need ssks uh, ssns uh, nuclear submarines for deterrence and all that uh, we also india also needs more surface vessels the indian ocean is key to india's security we cannot allow the chinese to 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 become a major force in the indian ocean region so we need more surface vessels lot more surface vessels the chinese navy is already the largest navy in the world numerically it it's not necessarily the most powerful navy but it is the largest navy so india needs lots of submarines india needs more surface vessels india needs to distribute its lethality not concentrate lethality in in, in large ships yeah and of course india needs to uh, focus on indigenization of its military and what is distributed lethality the number of ways in which you can i mean how you how you distribute your lethality and how, what is lethality the strength of a navy is not the number of ships that it can deploy the strength of a navy the true measure of a navy's strength or lethality is how many missiles it can deploy offensive missiles it can deploy at any given point in time that is a true strength of a of a navy's lethality so we need to distribute our lethality we need to have lot more missiles on ships and all that we need indigenization of the military we need to like i've said a 100 million times before now we need to reach a 10 trillion dollar economy as soon as possible we need minimum 7 to 8 percent growth of our economy year on year for the next 10 20 years and we need to have peace anyhow for at least a decade if we can maintain peace for a decade then you know uh will be able to achieve these objectives and we obviously india needs to balance the us and china and russia and other nations cooperate with like minded non english speaking countries and to keep uncle sam placated and mollified so the, these are the things india needs to do the, it's very easy to say this it's very easy to verbalize this it's very hard to actually do it but well if you want to be a great nation once again like you've always been we need to find ways of doing this so that's where india is that's what the whole deal with china china is always i have said this a million times india can never ever trust china the only long term solution to india china peace is the freedom of tibet there is no other option so india needs over the next 20 30 years to find a way of making of liberating tibet, tibet. india and china were where 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 coexisted for 3000 years india has existed for 10000 plus years china is about 3 3000 years old maybe 3 and a half thousand years old if you want to be charitable to them india and china have never been enemies china has absorbed so much indian culture incredible amounts of indian culture it's only since from the 1950s onwards that india and china became rivals adversaries because the chinese captured tibet and our weak need government allowed that to happen in the 1950s the great magnificent mr nehru so the solution to how do you bring about india china lasting peace it's only by liberating tibet by making tibet independent so that is something india will have to find a way of doing so until then there's the situation china is going to be an ever present threat on india's border northern border the himalayan border and we can never trust china we have to become stronger economically and militarily and uh, you know bricks and all is is nice but overall after after at the end of the day it is your nation first so that's where we are so bricks i would say that as long see it's just like sark sark is the south asian association of regional cooperation or whatever it is called yeah sark is is a non starter now it is it is essentially a dead organization why because it contains india and pakistan as long as you have two nations two major nations in a grouping of nations that are deeply adversarial to each other that coalition or grouping of nations is a non starter it's it's a uh, it's it's non viable it it's just it just won't work so brics may be going possibly in that direction i mean various nations want to be part of brics but they may also choose to you know work with china separately and of course there is the talk of brics currency and all that so that may also be in, in good for india so we will have to find ways of making certain things work but overall china is india's number one adversary india is india's number one threat and that is a given we can never keep our eyes take our eyes off that fact so that is the deal with china and what happened 
right now let's talk of something else something else that happened recently um amid the border tensions with china something else happened so what happened let's the missile test let's talk about the missile test where is the missile test let's put that on the screen um the news report where is it here it is the news report so amid border tensions with china india successfully tests the agni 5 missile that's what the hindustan times says uh, the test was carried out to validate new technologies and equipment on the missile which is now lighter and so on so forth here the agni 5 missile it says a uh, night trials it doesn't matter whether you do a trial at night or day missiles missile launches are they they don't care whether it's night or day so it's uh, it's a missile that's capable of hitting targets beyond 5000 kilometers with a very high level of accuracy uh, another another report here india successfully tests the agni 5 is it a warning to china and so on so here is the the range of the missile this is the notam that india had, had given out uh, about roughly 2 weeks before the test yeah so the missile splashed down all the way south almost south of madagascar and and, and west of australia that uh, 5400 kilometers was the range of this missile right and if you talk about the agni missile range these are the various ranges agni 2 agni 3 agni 5 so agni 5 is kind of what matches that range yeah 5000 5500 kilometers that that sort of thing and as you can see it can uh, pay a friendly visit to various capital cities around the world including obviously our best friends in beijing including uh, our good friends in in constantinople istanbul including our very good friends in moscow including our wonderful friends in 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 tokyo and so on we never want to do that but yeah the capability exists so this is the agni missile range the agni 5 is the is the one with the uh, largest range thus far now so you no know, various interesting things were seen for instance there was this this is very strange yeah the the missile was fired it was it was launched from the coast of 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 odisha odisha yeah and it was seen from mizoram's capital aizol the capital of mizoram in in the far east of india it was also seen from manipur yeah people saw it from manipur there are reports that it was seen from west bengal and there are also reports video evidence that it was seen from myanmar Myanmar would you believe it so this is an image of 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 this is i think from aizol in in uh, the far east the northeast of india you can see so what looks like stage separation there there's a different image which also kind of looks like stage separation how on earth is a can a missile that is launched from odisha and that goes south how on earth was it seen from 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 mizoram from manipur from myanmar as you can see myanmar is really far away and yet they were able to see it so that's kind of kind of strange yes and the other thing the other question is that was this really the agni 5 now first of all please understand that i have no inside information i am not in in contact with any government agencies with any of the scientists many with, with anybody whatever i am saying is just open source speculation so was this really the agni 5 or was it some other missile that was fired it appears that the that the trajectory of the missile was a depressed trajectory so missiles can take a lot of trajectories you know if you want to if you want to do a very very rough and somewhat incorrect approximation of a missile launch you can think of a ballistic a projectile projectile motion i think uh, it's it's something you taught in basic physics right in in high school you taught newtonian physics that is you first introduced to you first taught what is motion in one dimension yeah and then you taught projectile motion so the so projectile motion is essentially like firing a bullet in the air or firing a shell or a cannon ball into the air so that takes a parabolic trajectory so a very rough approximation of a ballistic trajectory which is actually quite wrong but you can use it as an approximation is ballistic ballistic uh, is is a projectile motion mm-hmm. so if you have projectile motion then you will see that the missile can take a different uh, variety of uh, paths in the air now it appears that this missile took a very depressed path you know it did not go very high above the atmosphere yeah it it kind of maybe skimmed the atmosphere just above the atmosphere and then reentered 
if that is the case then it it um it would mean that this missile has certain capabilities that we are we were not aware of uh, possibly and maybe the range also may not be exactly 5.5 thousand kilometers it may be a different the actual capability of the missile may be something else so we know that the agni 5 has a stated range of about 5500 kilometers the chinese allege that it has a 8000 or 9000 kilometer range that's what they have been alleging um, we have never substantiated the, the chinese allegations we may also have certain other missiles that are currently being baked in the oven yeah certain other missiles that may be under development so the question is what missile was this and the official reports even the go various government ministers not the defense minister but other ministers have said it was the agni 5 so there is a bit of ambiguity that we have maintained here and it's a good thing so i would say that we should not jump to the conclusion that it was the agni 5 it could have been something else it could have been a hypersonic glide vehicle it could have been who knows what but yeah so and the other question so the first thing is that it could have been some other missile possibly it could have been an actual IC, icbm you know 8000 10000 km range you can test an intercontinental ballistic missile in such a way that it it uh, travels only 4000 or 5000 km there are various ways of doing it either you you change the trajectory make it go high up in the atmosphere and drop drop down uh, closer to you or you could maybe put less fuel into it or whatever you know modify it in certain ways so as to fool the world so i'm not sure which missile was tested the official version is the agni 5 all right great but it could possibly have been something else but of course please remember i have no actual access to any privileged information so i'm just speculating here so the first thing is that it may have been some other missile or maybe the agni 5 whichever it is um so that's that's one thing right so that is about the agni 5 and uh, so the agni 5 first of all this is not the first if it was actually the agni 5 then it is not the first time that the agni 5 has been tested the agni 5 has been tested multiple times since 2012 and but the range has never been that long yeah so uh, so that's the thing so it could have been the agni 5 it could have been something else but the agni 5 is a well tested missile it may actually have already been uh, deployed incorporated into the armed forces yeah so the defense minister did not make any statement about the missile launch the drdo also did not make any statement official official statement about the launch various other ministers indian government ministers have spoken about this yeah that the that the agni 5 has been tested so that's the deal that that's what happened so my point is that it could have been some other missile it could have been the agni 5 and this was not in response to the chinese uh aggression at the border because the chinese aggression at the border happened uh, sometime about a week or so ago but this missile launch the no time was given more than 2 weeks ago so it's not like india knew that the chinese are going to do so and so thing and so and so date this was already announced and uh, the 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 chinese uh, spy ship the the, the electronics electronic uh, surveillance ship i don't know what is called yang yuang wang or whatever it's called it was supposed to come into the indian ocean region to monitor the missile test i'm not sure what happened maybe that is possibly the reason why the missile may have had a depressed trajectory not a high trajectory but a atmospheric skim skimming trajectory so as to stay below the range of the instruments or whatever so a whole lot of things could have happened here but what has been officially announced is that it was the agni 5 and whichever missile it was it has been tested successfully it has uh, whatever new technologies were were tested have been tested successfully so overall it's been it's been a success a success for india and it kind of tells the world that you know we have this capability we are not showing a larger range we are not testing a missile at the larger range but this range for for now is enough we can target very important capital cities across eurasia and maybe more so that's the message that has gone out to the world from this missile test so that's the deal with the uh, with this latest missile test now something else something another interesting thing was was seen uh, as a result of this missile test so uh, this was not seen as a result of the missile test but it was seen in the aftermath of the india china clash 
along the India Tibet border. So somebody tweeted out that an MQ9B drone was witnessed. Uh, there is this uh, website, it's called flightradar24.com, on which you have all this open source information that anybody in the world can see. It's not, there's nothing secret there. So you can see various aircraft at any given point in time, which are what the, the aircraft that are, that are flying anywhere in the world. Let me open that website for a second. Flightradar24.com. Let's put that on the screen, shall we? Let's put that on the screen. So uh, let us go to that. Yeah. So so let's understand what's happening here. So this is this is a live, essentially a live telecast of all the flights that are happening across the world right now. You can see it. Every single flight that is uh, uh, whose whose uh, data is openly available in the in the open domain. You know, public source data. So you can actually take a you know click on any any aircraft and you can see where it came from and where it's going, and so on. This is a Singapore Airlines flight from Zurich to Singapore. This is from Chongqing to Dubai. It's a Air China flight. What is this? This is a Emirates flight from Bangkok to Dubai, and so on. You get the point, right, what I'm saying. So now, the thing is this. So a, a day or so after the, day or two after the India-China border clash, somebody tweeted that they witnessed a certain aircraft a Q9. It's called Q9. So I took some screenshots. So, so this is something that's in available in the public domain. There is nothing secret about this. Okay, The world can see this and it was obviously seen by the world. So this aircraft was seen flying around Uttarakhand. Yeah? It's, a Q, it's called Q9 and then later you could see it go all the way down south. So that's a long, long distance this aircraft flew. flew. So this is the MQ9B Sky Guardian right? And it did not give any other information where it came from and all that, but this is the MQ-9B Sky Guardian. It is a, it is a hunter-killer drone. It has an endurance of 40 hours in all types of weather. It can safely integrate into civilian airspace and all that. It can fire missiles, it can do surveillance and, and much more. This is the General Atomics MQ-9 Reaper, but the MQ-9B is called the Predator, I think. It's called the Predator. Let's search for it. Uh, Q-9B, where is the Q-9B? 9B. There is a certain variant, the MQ-9B uh, and so on. So India has that one, right? This is the Wikipedia article. So now if you look at this article from the Hindu. This is from August 22. Okay, this year. It says that India is in an advanced stage of talks with the US for procuring MQ-9B drones. The MQ-9 Reaper that was used to launch a modified version of the Hellfire missile that eliminated Al-Qaeda leader Al Ayman Al-Zawahiri. Al 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 so the Hindu reported in August, late August, that India was in advanced stage of talks to acquire this drone. Now look at this. This is an article from Swarajya from May 28, which is before August. May, June, July, August, four months before August. Yeah. This Swarajya article says that India, Indian Navy's MQ-9B drones seen in satellite imagery for the first time in on Indian soil. So the Swarajya magazine had reported in May that India already has acquired at least two of these drones. And then these guys in Hindu, four months later, are still saying, reporting that India is in talks with the US to acquire these drones. <laughs> that kind of tells you the quality of reporting in the Hindu. Anyhow, so the point is that India has, it looks like, at least two of these aircraft. Yeah, And uh, if you read the article, it will, it will tell you where these, are, these aircraft are situated, which base they are situated in. And obviously, if you were to... If you had been tracking this this drone, you would have found that it did indeed go to that particular location. So the point is that India has acquired this very advanced and very uh, very capable uh, drone from the US, and it was being deployed along the India-Tibet border in light of the recent tensions with China. Interesting. 
So this is a drone that can be flown for more than 40 or at least 40 hours continuously. It can fly over the ocean. It can take out naval targets. And you can launch it from southern India and deploy it for, I don't know, 10, 12, 20 hours in the Himalayas and then bring it back to southern India. That's the kind of capability this drone has. Wonderful. So the Americans do have good technology and it's good that we have acquired this. So it's going to add more teeth to our capabilities and that's what we are doing. So it's a very interesting little thing that I witnessed and I kind of tracked the drone for several hours just to see where it is going. I thought it will it'll land somewhere in northern India, maybe in, I don't know, Kanpur or Lucknow or something. But it went all the way into the Indian Ocean, long sorty over the Indian Ocean, and then it landed at its air base in uh, somewhere in southern India. If you read the Swaraj article, you will know where it was. So once again, I am not giving any secret information. It's all available in the public domain, and military experts will know way more than this. I'm just giving you, you know, for your understanding, this information. So that is about the MQ-9B drone that India has acquired. Now, let's talk about the situation in Ukraine, because that is very relevant to, uh, to what's going on in the world right now. So what's happening in Ukraine? So I have been predicting that maybe this winter, the winter is almost here now. It's more or less officially here now. So I said that after the Rasputitsa season is over in, and winter properly sets in, when general winter sets in, that's when Russia will most likely, possibly, uh, launch a major winter offensive in Ukraine. Yeah. So what's happening right now in the in the Ukraine situation? Let's take a look at that. Uh, here we are. So this is from December 16. That's like yesterday. Russia launches another major missile attack on Ukraine. So Russia's bombardment campaign against Ukrainian cities continued unabated Friday with a major strike that sent dozens of missiles aimed at Kiev. The Ukrainian capital's air defenses claim to have knocked out the majority of incoming fire, shooting down 37 of in estimated incoming 40 rockets. In total, Ukraine's military claimed that it had shot down 60 of the 76 missiles. So they are claiming that they are knocking down all the missiles, but it's clear that the Russians are launching major mis waves of missile strikes across Ukraine. That's why I said that one of the major lessons of the Ukraine war is that you need to have a huge stockpile of missiles. Yeah. Uh, this is a defense of Ukraine Twitter account. It says Russia launched its ninth massive terrorist missile attack on Ukraine today. Same thing, out of 76, 60 were shot down, yeah. But it's clear that the Russians are targeting Ukraine's uh, electricity infrastructure, the electricity grid, yeah. And what is the consequence of that? Let's take a look at this. Net blocks. Metrics show that today's Russian missile attacks have resulted in a loss of connectivity and power in multiple regions of Ukraine, with authorities reporting Nine energy generation facilities damaged as a result of today's attack with 75, 76 missiles counted at the last update. Confirmed. Network data shows a significant disruption to internet connectivity in Ukraine, corresponding to power cuts amid new Russian missile attacks targeting critical infrastructure. National connectivity is at 60%, 68% of previous levels. So there, the Russians are targeting the Ukrainian power grid the Ukrainian power grid is said to be now operating at less than 50% of capacity. And there's, as you can see, there is a significant disruption to the internet connectivity in Ukraine. What else is happening? Okay, now this is a website called, this is an account called Critical Threats. It says that Russia may be setting conditions to conduct a new off offensive against Ukraine, possibly against Kiev in winter 2023. Such an attack is extraordinarily unlikely to succeed. That's fine. That's your opinion. Um, a Russian attack from Belarus is not imminent at this time. So they are also now, the Americans are now also coming, saying this publicly, stating this, that there could be a winter offensive against Ukraine. Winter 23, maybe late December 22, we don't know. Let's see. That's for Mr. Putin to decide. And they are saying that a Russian attack from Belarus is not imminent at this time. And now we see this. Mm -hmm. Belarus begins snap combat readiness drills. What does that mean? Here's more. Belarus begins snap combat readiness drills on the order of the pres country's president, Lukashenko. Uh, so yeah, the, the 
Belarus, which essentially is a is a Russian ally, it is now uh, indulging in these snap readiness drills. So let's take a look at Belarus. Where is Belarus so that we understand the situation? Ah, here's the map. Okay, so we know where Moscow is. That's the capital of Russia. We know where Ukraine is. This is the nation that is uh, we are talking about. And here is Belarus. So the West, the Western nations, NATO, they are funneling arms, ammunition, all that into Ukraine via Poland, mainly via Poland. And west, uh, sorry, east of Poland, you have Belarus, which is north of Ukraine. So Belarus is it, uh, is uh, has a very important geographical position in all in this this uh, geostrategic chessboard. And the Belarus armed forces are now uh, conducting military drills, readiness drills. And Belarus obviously is allied with Moscow. Yeah. So that is what is happening. Now, the Institute for the Study of War, it's an American thing, a think tank. It says that Belarusian forces remain unlikely to attack Ukraine despite a snap Belarus military readiness check today. They are claiming it's unlikely to happen. Fine, that's fine. And somebody is saying this is potentially very meaningful. I've seen dozens, dozens of videos of trains carrying Russian heavy equipment over the past several weeks. I've seen lots of recent train videos of Belarusian equipment. Here we have a train containing both. So it looks like the militaries of Belarus and Russia are coordinating, collaborating, and even combining their, their military supplies together, which is ominous. So there could be something that could happen from Belarus territory as well. You see? Because if the Russians make a move from the south, maybe towards Odessa, perhaps, Odessa, this major port here, then there could be a diversionary attack from Belarus as well or something like that. So there may be some coordination that could be about to happen between Russia and Belarus in the what in what could be a pot potential winter offensive. Or maybe it's just a diversion for NATO. Or maybe it's a diversion, or maybe they would want to uh, to shut down the the Poland Ukraine border to prevent NATO from from funneling arms and ammunition and supplies into Ukraine. So there are various possibilities, but now Belarus seems to have been activated as a pawn in the geostrategic chessboard. So that is something that we need to keep in mind. It could come into play over the next days and weeks. Yep. Um, Here's an interesting piece of news. The Pentagon has given Ukraine the green light for drone strikes inside Russia. And indeed, the Ukrainians carried out certain drone strikes deep into Russian territory. For instance, a drone struck an airfield in the Russian region of Kursk this week. I wonder how the Russians could, could respond to this. Will this not lead to escalations? But anyway, that's something that's happening. That The Pentagon has given Ukraine green light to launch drone strikes into Russian territory. Now look at this. Let's talk about Bakhmut. This is from the Hindu Sun Times. This is from yesterday. Ukraine's military is collapsing in Bakhmut. Vicious assault deals the Ukrainian military a heavy blow. So what is Bakhmut? Where is Bakhmut? Bakhmut is here. It is essentially on the front line between the Donbass region that Russia now controls and Ukrainian held territory. Yeah, so there is this massive battle, this offensive that's been going on in this one city, Bakhmut, for the past several weeks. And various commentators are calling it the Bakhmut meat grinder. It appears that the Ukrainians are suffering incredibly heavy casualties in Bakhmut. Yeah, so now here's something interesting. Um, uh, so the Bakhmut, like I said, they are calling it the Bakhmut meat grinder. This is a Western publication, The Guardian, which is from the UK. Yeah. And uh, this is, uh, so this is, an, this is a headline from the New York Times. It's from September 17. Yeah. Today is what? Today is December 17. This is from two months ago. So in September 17, on September 17, the New York Times was saying that Russia closes in on a critical city in Ukraine's east, which was Bakhmut. Okay, they were calling it a critical city in September. Now, what is the West saying? The Bakhmut meat grinder. This is a Radio Free Europe or whatever. Russian troops are pummeling this Donbas city, and it's unclear why. In this is from December 13, three days ago, four days ago. 
in september it was a critical city now the west is wondering why are the russians doing it what's the point of bakhmut see lots of voice of america russia investing large amount of its military might in ukraine's bakhmut fox news russia invests disproportionately costly offensive to take bakhmut despite low strategic value low strategic value <laughs> how did it become low strategic value when in september it was critical New York Post Russia puzzles with costly fight for small city of Bakhmut Ukraine so now that Russia is succeeding they are saying it is puzzling see guardian says we are scratching our heads we don't know why russia is focusing on bakhmut in september they knew it was a critical city now that the russians are winning they're saying it's it's we are wondering why it's happening my point is please don't trust the media the media will twist the narrative to suit certain agendas always in september the new york times was saying bakhmut was a critical city now they are all claiming that it is puzzling it is it is it is we are scratching our our heads why is this insignificant city why are the russians focusing so much on it right so when the russians attack a city which is important they will call it a critical city when the russians succeed they will say it was a low value target i don't know why we don't know why the russians are doing it so please understand this is i'm showing it showing you this in real time how the the narrative changes very rapidly over a question of a couple of months yes do not trust the media look at multiple sources 10 15 20 30 50 sources to get a proper idea of what's really happening yeah look at social media accounts maybe from small accounts also people who are actually on the ground reporting from the ground look at lots of different sources they do a 360 degree perspective only then will you get some idea of what's really happening and don't trust the big western media outlets they are lying to you yeah september it's critical now it's it's low value <laughs> how does it become low value what's really happening is that the bakhmut has this bakhmut city has turned into a complete meat grinder it's a horrible term to use it appears that tens of thousands of ukrainian troops have 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 lost their lives in this thing it's it's degrading the strength of the ukrainian military and i'm not sure why the west is encouraging ukraine to to spend so many human lives over there but that's what's happening so that is the bakhmut meat grinder yeah uh it's not a head scratcher it's not a mystery it's a critical city and the russians are winning it and the ukrainians are paying a hugely heavy price for it now another thing that's happening is this so the americans have imposed this this uh, oil price cap on russian oil 60 dollars per barrel right now here's something the russians could do they could say okay to to various nations european nations western nations okay you want to pay only 60 dollars for the for the oil that's fine but you must pay it in gold not in dollars so we will sell you the the oil at the price that you are setting at 60 dollars but you must pay that 60 dollars in gold not in dollars and they may even say instead of instead of one barrel we will offer you two barrels for 60 dollars but you must pay in gold if they do it then the price of gold will immediately double from 1800 dollars per 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 gram or or whatever it is you know an ounce to 3600 dollars an ounce and please understand that the russian ruble is tied to the price of gold it is the russian ruble is on the gold standard so that would double immediately the price of the the, the value of the russian ruble so that's the 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 game that is being played so the russians may say okay you want to do this price cap price cap game let's do it but we will not take us dollars we will not take payment in us dollars we will take payment in gold we will give you double the amount of oil of, of oil but you must pay in gold that will double the price of gold immediately in a very short time and it will double the value of the U, of the of the russian ruble as well so these are the the economic uh dealings that are going on yeah so you can read this article it's by anna golubova it, it, and you can see the if you want the link it's over here you can pause the video and take a look at it yeah so that's the kind of thing that's happening and now the other thing that's happening is that the world is now worrying about a possible worldwide conflict what do what do we mean by a possible worldwide conflict we are talking of ww3 world war 3 so there's this ipsos survey for halifax international security forum it has found that 73% of people on average across 53 nations 
expect that in the next 25 years we could see another world conflict involving superpowers or major powers similar to world wars 1 and 2 and uh, this is the the thing you know the major nations from their perspective are the ones in blue and red the us and canada and uh, you can see that most people believe that that most in in most nations a significant percentage of people believe that there's going to be a major war for india it's 79% for australia it's 81% what about china china is down here 64%. Japan is 51%. The Japanese people, I don't know what's happened to them. They seem to be living in some under some kind of delusion. But that's what it is. So now it is becoming, I mean, people are more and more believing, they're believing more and more that we could be in a situation that could le- lead to a World War III kind of situation within the next 25 years or maybe sooner. So that's the situation right now the world is becoming more pessimistic as these this conflict draw becomes further drawn out it goes on and various other geopolitical tensions continue the india china flashpoint the north korea flashpoint the china japan issue the chinese claims on japanese islands the chinese claim on claims on various territories with, with its various neighbors the japan russia territorial dispute in the kuril islands and so many other things there are many flashpoints in the world right now and all these these things are there yeah so people are becoming more pessimistic and people are expecting that maybe the world is inching towards a world war three kind of scenario now let's talk about one more thing let's talk about angela merkel so these days it's almost like every week there's a new embarrassing statement by a, a nato leader or you know a western leader a couple of weeks ago it was uh Ursula von der Leyen, Ursula von der Leyen, who made the embarrassing revelation that more than a hundred thousand Ukrainian military personnel have the, so far lost their life in the Ukraine conflict. More than a hundred thousand. That's a huge number. And then that video was quickly pulled down. It was edited, and that portion was cut out. So that's what uh, happened. Now there's a new interview that's come out. An interview with uh, the former general uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel. That interview is now in in just two three days. It's, it's disappeared. It's no longer available anywhere. It was it was a video interview with a German news organization. I think it was with DW. That interview is not no longer do, it can no longer be found online unless I don't know. I was not able to find it. And uh, that news has been scrubbed. So what did that la- the lady say? Let's find out what she said. So this is modern diplomacy. It says Merkel's confession could be a pretext for an inter- international tribunal. But what was the confession? Speaking, uh, it was their the site, the site. Speaking in her interview for the site, published on December 7, German ex-Chancellor Merkel said the following. The 2014 Minsk, agree- Minsk agreement was an attempt to buy time for Ukraine. Ukraine used this time to become stronger as we can see today. Ukraine in 2014-2015 and Ukraine today are not the same. Uh, According to the ex-chancellor, it was clear to everyone apparently Mm -hmm. that the conflict was suspended and the problem was not resolved but it was exactly what gave Ukraine priceless time. What was the Minsk the Minsk agreement? So the Minsk agreement had like I don't know, 11, 12, 13, 14 points, I think 13 points or so. It was an agreement between Russia and the West. It was an agreement between Russia and Ukraine mediated by the West, mediated by Russia, mediated by Germany and France, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And the first Minsk agreement was in 2014. It failed very rapidly. Then there was a new Minsk agreement, Minsk agreement, Minsk Minsk 2 in 2015, that also failed. And it failed because both sides did not agree to various terms. And I will not open the terms and all that. It will become a very long, drawn out thing. But it was an agreement that the Russians signed with Ukraine with the uh, mediation of the West. Now, it's now clear from this this goof up by this... this, uh, revelation by the lady that this was merely a ploy to buy time for Ukraine which means the West was already clear that there's going to be a war in Ukraine 
and they were going to push Ukraine to the brink of war through their actions. And they knew that the Russians would eventually have no option but to go to war. So in 2014, there was the Maidan coup in Ukraine. The Americans placed a puppet government in Ukraine. There was a brief period of time when there was no government in Ukraine. And that's when the Russians took Crimea. That's when the Russians captured Crimea. It looks like the Russians should have captured Donbass and other parts of Ukraine too at that time itself. Instead of doing that, they sat down on the negotiating table and they were fooled. So lots of Indians think that Mr. Putin is infallible. He is this superhuman, superhero person. Well, he was played for a fool. by Especially by Angela Merkel. Because Putin... Uh, seems to have a great deal of regard for the lady he has known her ever since he became ever since she became the chancellor like in the in the mid 2000s yeah and uh, yeah so they fooled vladimir putin if he had taken donbas and various parts of ukraine at that time i don't think the west could have gotten involved the way it is involved right now and they this gave ukraine from 2014 to 2022 I, uh, nearly eight years, a period of time in which it was able to significantly bolster its military capabilities with the help of the West. So they, they, they all got together to fool Vladimir Putin. Yeah. And now Putin says that he is disappointed by Merkel's words about the Minsk agreements. I think he should be more disappointed about being so gullible and being, ma being made a fool of. So we say that Indians are easy to fool. The Indian uh, leadership at various points in time has trusted, let's say, China and trusted other countries and we have been betrayed, backstabbed. Well, here we have Vladimir Putin trusting the West, trusting Angela Merkel, trusting NATO, being so gullible. And now he is feeling like he has been backstabbed after what Merkel revealed a week or so ago. So here we have the great Vladimir Putin it has been now revealed that he was played for a fool. He was fooled, completely fooled. He trusted NATO. He trusted the leaders of NATO. There is no trust in geopolitics. There are, there are no friends in geopolitics. Maybe he should, he should pay attention to what I say from time to time. <laughs> so there you have the great Vladimir Putin was fooled by NATO. How interesting is that? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so that's about that. Now let's talk about one more thing before we end. Let's talk about Twitter. Twitter files is a big deal these days. Uh, the US mainstream media is not covering the Twitter files revelations at all. They're keeping very quiet. Very quiet. But yeah, the rest of the world is noticing what's happening. So let's. Uh, there have been like four or five installments of the Twitter files. Yeah. And one of the main protagonists or the main journalists who has been reporting about the Twitter files is a lady called Barry Weiss. Yeah. So uh, let's let's put on the screen something she tweeted. Barry Weiss. So she went on this. Uh, she she has created this Twitter thread in which she has uh, revealed lots of things. Recently, uh, I think yesterday it was revealed that Twitter has had become an extension of the FBI more or less. They were taking orders from the FBI and they were doing whatever they were being told. So it means that Twitter was an extension of the US deep state. Let's use the term deep state. What is the deep state? It is the true power in the US. The US president doesn't really have much power unless that president is mentally competent and in line with the agenda of the deep state. Uh, currently, we have a president in a, uh, who is not very mentally competent and a, and a vice president who is clueless. And in the past, we have had presidents like Mr. Kennedy who were against the agenda of the truth of the, of the deep state and we know what happened to them. So, Twitter had become a geopolitical extension of the deep state. The deep state of the US was using Twitter for its geopolitical, to, to further its geopolitical agenda. Now, um, over here, Barry Weiss talks about the, the kind of bias that Twitter had that... Uh, Ali Ayatollah Ali Khamenei tweeted that tweeted that Iran Israel needs to be destroyed, and Twitter did not ban him. Yeah, uh, she speaks about uh, Mahathir Mohammed, who said that the Muslims should kill millions of French people, and his his account was not banned. And he talks about she talks about the president of Nigeria who incited violence. Twitter deleted the tweet but did not ban him. Uh, the Ethiopian Prime Minister. 
called on citizens to take arms against Tigray on Twitter, and the tweet was remained was allowed to remain up, and the prime minister was not banned, and so on. And then she talks about Prime Minister Modi. In early February 21, Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government threatened to arrest arrest Twitter employees in India and to incarcerate them for up to seven years after they restored hundreds of accounts that had been critical of him. Twitter did not ban Modi. And she is not tweeting, she is not putting a screenshot of a tweet by Mr. Modi, which does anything like what the others have done. Instead, she is putting a screenshot of a New York Times fake news article. Yeah, she worked for the New York Times and she has said that the New York Times is not good, but she conveniently put a screenshot of a New York Times headline, which was a fake news headlines headline. And she doesn't refer to New York Times in this tweet. So some so she's, she's essentially peddling more fake news here. And this was like, you know, the Indian government responded. This is fake news. The government of India, led by Prime Minister Modi, said that all have to follow the law of the land and any non-compliance will lead to loss of exemption from liability as intermediate status under IT Act. There were no arrest threats. These are the facts. So Barry Weiss is lying. This is this is outright blatant fake news that she is putting out. When, when it comes to the other leaders that she's she's giving actual evidence. So all of this is real news, but with respect to India, she's putting out fake news. And the Indian government responded and, 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 and you know, uh, it, pu- it uh, put out the facts. And then once again, we have this article. So once again, the mainstream Indian media, whether it is the print or the squint or the Hindu or whatever else, they have completely kept quiet about this. It is Op India that has written about this, that Barry, Barry Weiss using, uses a misleading New York Times report to make false claims about Modi government's warning to Twitter to follow Indian law. Twitter has to follow Indian law in India. Is that something wrong? On the one hand, we have various uh, leaders like Mahathir Mohammed who are calling for killing of millions. We have Khomeini who's asking for the destruction of Israel. And the Modi government is asking for Twitter to follow Indian law. How can you equate these things? There is clear malice in this tweet. There are certain intellectual Indian uh, commentators who have said that this is stupidity. It is not malice. I'm sorry. This is not stupidity on the part of Barry Weiss. This is outright malice. She could not find any tweet that she could put out like she's done uh, over here. So she put out a fake news report and she's lying over here. This is a lie. This is an outright lie. The facts are known. The facts are out here. The facts are are listed in, in great detail in this article. So Barry Weiss, who Elon Musk, see, here's the question. Why did Barry, why did Elon Musk trust unhinged, vacuous ex-New York Times airhead Barry Weiss to report in the Twitter files. I, I may have used a slightly strong language, but that's fine. Her actions aren't stupid, like some people have suggested. Her track record, numerous data points, reveals bias and malice. For instance, there is this clip on the Joe Rogan podcast in which she launches a baseless assault on Tulsi Gabbard. Barry Weiss, in this in this clip, she calls Tulsi Gabbard a monstress. And she calls her, calls Tulsi Gabbard a Assad toady without any evidence. And when Joe Rogan asks for the evidence, she's not able to provide any. Joe Rogan even asks his guy, what's his name? Uh, the guy who assists him to, to find some evidence and put on the screen. There is none. Yeah. So she has a track record of lying she, she is not a trustworthy journalist. She is not a serious journalist. She cannot be taken seriously. And Elon Musk has trusted her to report on the Twitter files. So that raises the question as to why has Elon Musk, one of the most intelligent people in the world, trusted somebody as, well, as questionable as Barry Weiss to report on the Twitter files. And now more revelations have come out about the Twitter files that, um, let's see, what revelations have come out. Uh, Twitter files, this one here, the new one. So Twitter has become, had become an FBI subsidiary. Twitter was very much part of the US deep state and the deep state operations worldwide. Now Elon Musk has taken over and he's trying to, you know, put out the facts about how Twitter was corrupt, how Twitter was biased and all that. And yet he has 
trusted Barry Weiss, who is not trustworthy, to report on this. And and she has gone ahead and reported f- maliciously fake news about India and the Indian government. So the question is, what's going on? Is Elon Musk stupid? I don't think he's stupid. He's one of the most intelligent people in the world. So then what's going on? That's the question. So the truth is, the tr- truth possibly could be that now that the whole world knows, by now the whole world knows that Twitter was deeply corrupt, deeply biased, deeply prejudiced. And the whole world more or less also knows that Twitter indulged in significant electoral interference in the 2020 presidential elections in the US. Everyone knows this now. They favored the Democrats and tried to hinder the Republican campaign. They even banned a sitting president of the US. Yeah. Incredible. So everyone knows that Twitter indulged in blatant electoral interference, which means that the 2020 election was not a free and fair election in the US. They call themselves a democracy. First of all, they're a two-party state. And secondly, there is electoral interference from the deep state. So the deep state wanted to make the Democrats win and they wanted Trump to lose. The deep state wanted that. And Twitter was one of the major weapons in this. Yeah. So now the world knows that 2020 is a questionable election. Trump has been saying that for the longest time. Now the whole world knows it by now. And the world also knows that Twitter was deeply, deeply biased. So this could be the Twitter fires, all these revelations. They are not bringing out something shocking. They are bringing out facts that the world essentially already knew. Some some data points are, are like, you know, interesting. But overall, the picture that's been pointed, that's been painted, is what we already suspected or already knew all these years. Nothing really new is coming out. So this could be an attempt to actually whitewash Twitter's reputation and make it seem to the world that Twitter can now be trusted. Yeah? And to kind of whitewash the reputation of the of the or of the US overall by bringing Twitter under a new custodian and maybe Twitter will still continue to be used as a tool, a weapon of the US deep state. I can promise you that nothing significantly incendiary will come out on the Twitter files. Nothing that will actually point to the real people who hold true power in the US. Nothing of that sort will come out. Yeah? Yeah, even the COVID files are going to come out. Elon Musk has has said that he is going to go after Fauci, Dr. Anthony Fauci and all. The whole world knew more than a year ago that Anthony Fauci, Fauci was a fraud. So he's just going to confirm that for you. That's it. So it looks like the Twitter files are a a whitewashing operation to make the people believe now, worldwide, that now Twitter is going to run smoothly and it's no longer corrupt and it's under the right right leadership. I can assure you that Elon Musk also cannot reveal certain things that the deep state, the FBI or whatever doesn't want him to reveal. Yeah. So yeah, they have thrown Vijaya Gadde under the bus. She deserves it. Yeah. Crooked lady. They've thrown, uh, to some extent, Jack Dorsey under the bus. To some extent, not so much. But yeah, uh, no one liked him anyway. People, people, people were sick of him. So yeah, that too. And Anthony Fauci. Yeah. So they are essentially getting rid of the of the trash. But Twitter is still going to firmly remain under deep state control, I assure you. Yeah. So that's the deal. So, and, and you know, Elon Musk may, may mean well. He may believe in free speech. His real agenda is to take, is to reach Mars. The other stuff is all, uh, you know, a sideshow, essentially. So uh, one must not place too much trust in Elon Musk, too much trust in in Twitter. We have to take all these revelations with a spoonful of salt because there's a whole lot that is not being revealed and which will not ever be revealed. Don't trust blindly. Never trust anyone blindly. All right? Uh, so yeah, that brings me to the end of today's session, today's episode of the Indian Interest. I hope it was valuable, useful. I hope you learned something. Um, so yeah, thank you for watching and I will see you in less than 24 hours. Tomorrow we have the latest episode of the Ask Abhijit Show. Tomorrow is going to be at 8 p.m. Indian time. 8 p.m. Indian time, not 9 p.m. as usual. I'm going to be watching the World Cup final match and 
I'll answer questions in between. I'll take questions from the comments. I'll take questions from the live chat. And I'm going to watch the World Cup final. And we can have a nice discussion, conversation tomorrow. So that is tomorrow on the Ask a Bit show. So until then, take care. And I will see you tomorrow very soon. Take care. Thank you very much.